what went well, what went wrong, and what was hard for developers, what was hard for end users, and what we can improve. And that's what we did. And we started by reevaluating our complete problem space. And when you think about it, there is no such thing as the e-commerce problem, just like there's no such thing as the content management problem. Instead, you have this group of problems that are connected. You have pricing and catalog management and order fulfillment and taxes and many, many other things, addressing. And when you think about it, these problems are not exactly ties to Drupal. So maybe we can solve some of them outside of Drupal. So we started our development by first creating four libraries. We took out the core logic, the heavy logic, the logic that depended on external data sets, and we created completely independent PHP code that doesn't actually need any specific framework. We created the INTL library for currency management and formatting, giving you a list of currencies and a way to format them. An addressing library that knows how to uh, present an address and validate an address. Uh, we created a library for zones, which are geographical groupings, and a really powerful text library. We'll cover all of this functionality as it pertains to commerce. But the point is that by first creating libraries, we opened ourselves to new communities. And by doing that, we got additional maintainers for stuff that's usually very hard to maintain because people don't like to spend as much time on maintaining lists of tax rates, for example. And we also got a lot of external validation, which means that commerce currently is not even in alpha. That's going to happen by the end of the year. But our addressing and tax code has been used in production for this whole year, which means that people have already found bugs that might have tripped you up otherwise. I got a bug report about addressing saying uh, your China postal code validation is not completely precise. I said fine. And then there's FoxyCart, a SaaS solution that's using our tax library. They realize that our library doesn't cover a US company registered in the EU to collect VAT. Okay, so we fixed that as well. Many, many corner cases uh, have been fixed this way and it means that we are launching with a much stronger offering this time around. And when building the Drupal side on top, it also means that we need a way to pull those libraries in. Now, if you remember Drupal 7, that means, meant downloading libraries manually from GitHub or some other place and extracting them into a folder, and that was it. But PHP libraries cannot be installed that way anymore. They actually need to be installed using Composer every single time. There is no manual download. Why? Because first we need to download the dependencies as well, and libraries nowadays have dependencies, and then we need to include all of that code into, into the autoloader, and this is what Composer does. And in case you haven't used Composer yet, Composer is basically the drush make of the PHP world, but it's not limited to Drupal projects, it can download anything, and it can recursively resolve dependencies, which means I can say, get me commerce, and then it says, okay, wait, but you also need address, and then it gets address as well, but then it says, the address module needs the libraries, and then it downloads those as well, and it keeps going until everything is downloaded and ready. So it's a much more powerful alternative to drush make. And a year ago, when we actually started developing the, commerce side, the Drupal side of commerce, we realized that the Composer support was still in very early stages inside Drupal. So we took over Composer Manager, and we rewrote it three times and made maybe seven releases. Uh, and so Composer Manager creates this additional Composer command that scans your modules, figures out the library dependencies, and then it calls Composer to download those. And this is still the default way of doing Composer with Drupal. But at the same time, we worked with the core community to improve the situation. So what you can actually do now, if you add the Drupal packages repository to your composer.json file, is simply type composer required Drupal commerce, and it will download everything. It will download the Drupal modules, it will download the PHP libraries, and you're done. 
In the future, this will be the only way to install commerce. You will never actually go to drupal.org and click download on the tarball unless you want to open it in your editor and look at the code. Why? Because if we need to use Composer to get the libraries, we might as well use it to get everything. And then Composer allows us to have additional spins that can give you a command to get commerce optimized for digital versus events versus physical products and so on. I can simply provide lists of modules that should be downloaded along with all of their dependencies. Now, I could speak for two hours just about Composer alone, but I don't have time for that. So you have a link at the bottom of the slide to my really nice WordPress blog post. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I get criticized for that a lot, but I was young and foolish. So in any case, <laughs> I have this great blog post that introduces the whole situation and goes into a lot of detail for how Composer works with Drupal. So if you're interested, go there and give it a read. At one point, we will definitely be moving that to Drupal.org. Uh, maybe one of you can do it. That would be great. Of course, commerce does not exist in a vacuum, which means that we have dependencies, dependencies that we need to use uh, to get a, a good experience. And one of those new dependencies is inline entity form. We developed that back for Kickstart and used it to create product entities from the parent node. And it's now become one of the most used Drupal modules uh, because it's simply convenient. It allows you to manage the related entities on another form. And of course, we needed to port it to Drupal 8 and we were in luck because the media team decided to adopt it as well. So Webflow and Yanis, who leads the media initiative, and he's here somewhere, I think. Uh, so they worked on the ports, and inline entity form is now usable. It's still buggy, but we hope to have our really stable beta release by the end of the year. Since these bugs translate into bugs on the product and order forms, that means they're important for us. So go ahead and contribute there. Uh, we also created the address module, and I'm really proud of, of this one. It's the heir of the address field module. It provides a way to store an address, but also validate it and format it. And it's now production ready. We have a beta to release, and we have complete test coverage, which is something that the Drupal 7 version never had. So what it is that makes address so complex? I mean, it took us a month of full-time development to do it. Well, it turns out that every country does addresses differently. Every country uses different fields on their addresses with different labels in a different order and validates them differently. And in address field for Drupal 7, we started by adding basically form alters to handle all of the specific use cases, and it just exploded. And this time around, we realized we needed this concept of an address format that has all of those rules in a piece of configuration. And then when you select a country on the address form, uh, it can load the address format and use that to build the widget to validate the input or to do the formatting. And by doing this, we basically solved the whole problem of address field not being maintainable. Since then, it has actually been backported into the Drupal 7 module as well. Now, we also needed uh, a data set. We needed all of these rules for different countries. And we found that from Google. Google created a completely open source data set for Android and Chrome. It wasn't actually freely available at the time, but we got their confirmation that we can release it in an MIT licensed library. So we did that. And that's how our addressing library was born. It also has the Symfony validator integration that validates the address. And then the Drupal module provides a UI for address formats that you can use to customize if you your client is complaining because some rules are not precise enough, perhaps. And it provides the widget and formatter plugins and everything that goes with it. We have address formats for over 200 countries, and we have subdivisions for over 40, including those for countries that have multiple levels. So, for example, we have municipalities in Brazil and three levels in China. It's really, really impressive. There's more than 12,000 of them in total. We also added this concept of zones. A zone is a geographical grouping, so it is a list of countries or states, including or excluding certain postal codes. And this is interesting because it allows you to really simplify your rules. When I was looking at rules, I realized that many people had up to 20 conditions that simply compared uh, addresses. And this way you can move all of this, and you can say this zone represents Germany and Austria, and we have one shipping rate for them versus different shipping rates for the rest of the EU. 
and it's also useful for taxes, because I don't know if you know, but Austrian VAT is not used in all of Austria. There's a piece of Austria at the German border that actually uses German VAT. So we needed to say uh, the Austrian VAT zone covers all of Austria except these postal codes, and then the German VAT area covers all of Germany plus these areas in Austria. And so this was a way to accomplish that, and I think it will really simplify the way we do shipping and taxes and uh, rules comparisons in general. And this is a part of the address module, the zone config entity and the, the matching plugin architecture. Then we started working on profiles. So customers have profiles. The profile is the entity that holds the address, but also instructions for delivery, the phone number, or any other information you need to bill a customer or to actually ship to a customer. Uh, and previously, Commerce used our own entity type called Customer Profile. And at the same time, there was this module called Profile 2, Fago's module. And sometimes people would actually use both because they needed a profile for non-commerce purposes as well. And this was just duplication. So this time around, we joined forces with the Profile 2 team. And my idea of naming it Profile 3 was not accepted. So now it's actually called Profile. Uh, we might get it in core one day. I don't know. We'll see. But in any case, we are now working really hard on porting it. Pedro Cambra, our contributor, is now working on redoing the UI because it got stale because of core changes. And I'm hoping that by the end of the year, we'll have a really solid beta that you can use both inside commerce and outside of commerce. And you came here to listen about commerce, but here I am talking about addressing and profiles and whatnot. So let's actually take a look at some commerce stuff so that Ruben here is not disappointed. We started by improving the currencies. That's one of the basic building blocks of e-commerce. Commerce 1.x had this fixed list of currencies we shipped with, but then we realized that that list gets outdated all the time because a currency might stop being used, a new one might be added, or inflation might just remove the decimals, the minor units of a currency. Formatting rules change. So we needed uh, an external source that you could use to keep that list updated and up to date all the time. And we found it in CLDR, which is a repository of completely open source data maintained by Google and Apple and Microsoft and used everywhere. Uh, and it has many, many interesting things. So in JSON format, you can get a really good country list with country names translated into all languages. Address module actually ships with that one. So if you use address module, the country list is always translated. You don't need to do it manually. And it does that for currencies as well, as, as well as many other things. So we, our INTL library ships with the currency list, and we give you an import form. So when you install commerce, you can select the currencies you're planning to use, and then it will import the data from the CLDR list that we ship with the library into Drupal config entities. And since these are config entities, for the first time, you can actually have an edit form for currency information, which is something that people built a contrib for in the Drupal 7 times. Uh, and you can customize everything. Also, we will import translations, translated currency names and symbols for each language that you have. And if you add a new language, tomorrow you decide your site's going to be in French, we will import the translations for that language as well. So we detect a new language being added which means that for the first time you can build a screen like this. So booking.com has a bunch of currencies and it will show the translated names and symbols based on your current language. This is really a pain in the behind to build in D7 because you need to translate all of this manually. But now it's all done for you. And then we use currencies to in prices, of course. We realized that in one text, the currency formatting was not precise enough because we tied it to the currency. But a single currency will look different in different countries. Look at the same euro amount in France, Germany, and the UK. It's different. Why? Because actually number formatting depends not on the currency and not on the language, but on the locale, which is a combination of language and country. So we needed to add this concept to commerce because core still doesn't have it. Basically, we take the current language from core, and then we, re we resolve the country by taking either the size default or the country from the customer profile, for example, and then we use that to build the locale. 
So basically, a currency won't look the same in Germany and Austria and in Germany and Germany. And if we know that you're using German and you're located in Austria, we can use that to show the right, to show the price in the right way. And you can see at the bottom that we have uh, a, we have a nice price widget, and it's a, it actually has a price uh, a placeholder that shows you how the price is supposed to be entered. Because what I've, what we've seen is that many European uh, languages use a comma as a decimal delimiter instead of a dot. So sometimes the customer would try to use a comma and the system wouldn't accept that. So we had a long-standing feature request in one the text to fix that. Now it's actually recognized. We know that, for example, the French locale uses uh, a comma here, so it's an accepted format. And we even support alternative numbering systems. Look at the last piece of the picture. If the locale is using a different numbering system, like Hindu or Arabic numbers or a few others that we support, <laughs> Bengali, then that will also work thanks to CLDR and our INTL library. So it's really, really powerful this time around. And then we have the biggest concept that we've introduced in Commerce Wondotex, and this is the concept of stores. In Wondotex, it was always assumed that you have a single store, a single billing location. If you bought from my site and I'm in Paris, France, then that's where we bill you from and that's the end of it. But now we support having multiple stores. And a store represents a billing location. And there are two use cases here. One use case is that you have a company with multiple offices. For example, Commerce, is Commerce Guys is registered in Paris, France, in London, UK, and in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And based on your location, when you buy a platform, we will bill you from one of these locations. If you're from Germany, you will be charged by Commerce Guys Paris. But if you're from Canada, you will be charged by Commerce Guys US. And now this kind of thing is supported because you can add a store for each of your locations and then use that. In this case, the product uh, catalog is actually shared. And then the second use case is the Etsy use case, where you have people registering and offering their own products on sale. So Ruben registers and he does his own thing, and then someone else registers, they do the same thing. And that way you have stores with their own product catalogs. In both cases, you have an order per store, because the billing location actually has tax implications. Uh, so we enforce that you have a cart per store, and you, if you have multiple stores, you can have multiple carts, same UX as on Etsy, and you have multiple checkouts, one per store. Uh, on the other hand, a product can be available from any number of stores if you choose to do so. We also created this really nice uh, selector and widget that works on any entity type, and it changes itself based on how many results there are. So if you ha only have access to view one store, your own store, then the selector will be hidden, and that's it, the system adjusts. And if there are a thousand stores that you could select from, then this is no longer a set of checkboxes, it's an autocomplete. So basically we improved the UX in that area as well. Uh, so to recap, you can share a product catalog or you can have it per store and you will be able to limit the payment methods and discounts and shipping services per store, which means that most of the pain that third party, well, contribs that try to implement the Etsy model had, now all of that is done by Commerce Core and the rest is just UI tweaks. When you install Commerce, there's a two-step process for getting started. You need to select and import a currency, and you need to create a store. The store has the default currency selected. And to make this quicker, we also provided our first Drupal console command, uh, which allows you to enter the initial details about your store. And when you enter the country, it will figure out by asking the library, the INTL library, which currency is used in that country and offer to import that as well. You can change it or you can just press enter. And when you do, it imports the currency and creates the store. And I'm taking time to talk about this because I think that we will be using Drupal console more and more as Drupal 8 developers in general. And since the 
DX of writing new commands is so good, I'm actually going to be writing console commands and shipping them with commerce to allow you to actually uh, provide information to the system and then have it configure itself for the use case that you wanted, which is much nicer than shipping with endless bundles of configuration. One of the most often criticized parts of initial commerce 1.0 was the product architecture. We created, basically you needed to create the product entities which represented individual variations, and then you needed to reference that from a node you created. So you had this two-step process, and of course nobody liked that. And at the same time, well, a bit later, when we built Kickstart in 2012, we built inline entity form and allowed you to use the same screen. But some problems still remained because the data model was a bit unclear. You needed to also generate the title, there were translation problems, and so on. And we also had a problem with attributes, which are specific fields that you can use to select a variation, like size and color, where we allowed different field types to have the same role, which meant double documentation. So we rethought all of that for commerce to the text, and we now have two entity types. We have products and product variations, managed from the same screen. When you create a product, you get this node-like form. Products are basically nodes in, um, when it comes to UX, and then you have an inline entity form that allows you to define one or more variations. If you have attributes, you will have multiple variations and it will look like this. And if you only have one variation, then you will only see a field set on the main form. So basically we ship with nice UX by default this time around. We don't need Kickstarters to fix it for us. And we also fixed attributes so that they can only be entity references pointing to uh, some entity type like taxonomy terms because that means that on the other side attributes are represented as entities. So you can attach a color swatch to a color or an image to, I don't know, a material uh, attribute and then use that to have a nicer add to cart form. And when it comes to product architectures, there is no one true answer and one true solution. Many clients will have different needs. We ourselves had a client that needed a custom product architecture. Or you might be using product bundles, which need their own thing. So this time around, we support any number of product architectures. Commerce order does not depend on commerce product. Nothing depends on commerce product. Commerce product is just a module that defines the default and most commonly used product architecture. And if you look at the picture here, you will see that we have a purchasable entity interface. Any content entity type that implements this interface can be purchased with commerce. And we only have a few simple methods that anyone can implement, basically <laughs> saying this is the entity, the line item type we're going to end up on, and this is the title you should use. And by default, you usually just uh, proxy that to the entity label. But the point is, if you have any custom needs or you have your own opinion, you can use console to generate an entity type, you can implement this interface, and boom, commerce is now able to interact with it, and you can use that uh, to purchase products of that type. Uh, when we actually have uh, an entity type selector on the line item type where you can select which entity type is being purchased by that line item. One other thing that we have is a new availability API. This is basically the commerce uh, stock base module. Uh, imagine that you are selling t-shirts and you only offer red t-shirts, but now you want to start selling blue. But blue t-shirts won't be available until February 1st. So there are two options that Commerce to the Text gives you. Either you will unset that variation and not show it at all before February 1st, or you will use the availability API to show that the shirt is there, but the add to cart form will be disabled with a message not available. This is what Commerce Talk also does. So we now have this API that both Commerce Talk and other modules can implement. They allow you to check, is this product available? If it's not in stock, if it's too early, or anything else, then the system will know how to handle that. So this means that Commerce Talk will be much, much smaller and easier to port, and that we have this important functionality in core. Because even outside of the stock use case, you might need it. For example, you, one of the products might simply not be available in your country because of regulations and whatnot. Uh, you will also see that th one of the first methods on this interface is applies. Basically, any 
tagged service that we have. And this is the Drupal way of Drupal 8's replacement of, for hooks for extensions like this. Basically, you implement our interface and then give your service in services YAML a tag. Um, and you will see that this interface has an applies method, which means that each checker can tell you which product entity types it relates to. So you can say, I only work with default commerce products, or I work with any purchasable entity type. Uh, this is just one of the reflections of supporting custom product architectures. This time, in core, we also have order and line item types. Previously, you needed to install the commerce order types or commerce customizable products modules, and that made no sense. So this time around, this functionality is in core, which means that you can expose any field as customizable on the add-to-cart form, and you can have multiple order types that have each their own workflows, their own checkouts which is something that actually the commerce order types module never was able to do because checkout was the same for all. And since carts are orders, this means that you can have different carts for different order types, which means that if you need to enforce that people will have separate carts for the digital products and the physical products, you can actually configure that with no extra logic. This is something I've seen uh, many times, and this is now possible just as a result of a more flexible architecture. And then you can say that your donations have a different checkout form than your platform subscriptions or whatever else you're selling. So we've now reached orders, and I've intentionally not added any screenshots here because this is still in progress, and if you install commerce, you won't be able to see it because it's across multiple pull requests with mock-ups in the issue queues and different people working on different things, but we are planning to finalize this in the upcoming two weeks, so we will be able to see a lot of the UX improvements and so on. The first thing we have started improving is the concept of order statuses and states. So if you've used commerce before, okay, let's stop. Who here has actually used commerce one? Nice. So what I'm seeing is that most people here have used commerce one.x, and I consistently see that in my talks, which is, which is why I keep speaking like you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so basically, we first had the problem of order statuses. We had this central status full of different statuses, and we used that not just to indicate which uh, state of the order it's in, but also the checkout page it's on, I mean the customer is on, the payment status, the financial status, and the fulfillment status, which means we had four different concepts overlapping over a linear set of statuses. And Bart Fenstra was complaining yesterday that we had buggy behavior based on whether the payment occurred before or after the end of checkout because the pingback from the payment provider is asynchronous. So the customer might have already gone to the end of checkout or he might have not. And usually that would not matter at all except it does because we have a linear set of states that uh, try to tell you different things. So this time around we've separated those. We have a really generic short order state workflow, and then we have a fulfillment workflow, a payment workflow, and we have a Boolean indicating whether an order is a cart. This means we've actually divorced different concepts. And I'm actually developing a custom workflow module to handle all of this. Basically, for order workflows, you write a YAML file, just like you would when you define menu links, uh, and then you can choose that for different order types. I'm not yet sure what namespace it's going to live in, but we'll see. Uh, and another uh, effect of this is since we now define the states and we define the transitions, we can actually offer you a better UX because we can say uh, that the order cannot be canceled before it's actually completed or it cannot be refunded before it's shipped. Or we can say you are not allowed to enter fulfillment until you finish validation, which means yeah, the customer needs to confirm the order or the admin needs to do something. So you can now actually define custom workflows where you integrate custom business requirements and the UI reflects that, telling you what you can and cannot do and why. So I'm really excited about that. And at the same time, we are really looking into the whole design of the order 
for admin screens because that was traditionally a very weak area and we are now improving it. So that means that, for example, you won't need the address book module anymore because profile gives you that on the customer side, the, the user pages, and then commerce order defines the, the widget on the order side that allows you to select a previously used address when you're creating an order. This is something that never actually got functional in commerce 1.x. Uh, and the UX now is much better. We are also looking at improving order level pricing because commerce 1.x only has line item level pricing. This means that when we build the commerce discount module, we need to invent this whole new level of pricing and we introduced many bugs that took us a long time to actually resolve. Commerce discount should only be a stupid UI for the pricing logic and we are fixing that by actually reevaluating our pricing. And it will make it much easier to in integrate external services such as Evalara and Exactor. I actually spoke to the Evalara people and they're very excited about the changes that we are making because it makes their lives much easier. We also made many improvements to taxes because the situation in the world of taxes has changed completely in the past five years. People who live in the EU know that since 2015, the law has changed for digital products. If a French company is selling to a German customer, it must charge German VAT. If it's selling to a Spanish customer, it must charge Spanish VAT, which is crazy. Uh, this means that the system actually needs to know many more rates and you should not expect the merchants to actually define 28 different tax rates or more. So this time around the tax library ships with a data set of known tax rates. We have all of the tax rates for EU, for Switzerland, for Australia, almost done with Canada. So the community is working on this. If you're not from one of these countries, contribute. And this means that when you install commerce and you say, I want to sell from Austria, we will create the Austrian tax rates for you and configure it. And since we know the address of your store, it's a field on the store entity, this means that we know when to actually apply the Austrian VAT. We can say, oh, look, the store is in Austria and the customer is in Austria. Let's go ahead and try to apply the Austrian VAT by default. This is something, uh, this is a default where you needed to use rules before and configure it, but now the system is smart enough to do this for you. And we also designed the config entities so that they account for uh, changing amounts. Let's say that Austria has decided to change the percentage of its default VAT from 19 to 20%. I'm not sure what your default rate is. But in any case, if that change happens on January 1st, you would have needed to spend your New Year's Eve with your finger on the button. So at midnight, you click the button and the rate changes. So if anyone decides to purchase your product at 2 a.m., they will get the correct taxes and your accountant won't be mad at you. This time we can actually specify amounts with their start and end dates, which means that the system will automatically select the right amount based on the date. And it also means that we have uh, known amounts retroactively. So our EU rates have known percentages for the past 15 years. So if you're importing data from an uh, older system, for example, it knows what to associate, which is useful. We also have tax resolvers, which are special classes that determine which tax type and tax rate should be used. Previously, we tried to do this with rules, but realized that the logic gets really, really complex. You need to have tests for this, and commerce needs to do a lot more than it did before. So now we have logic that can determine B2B versus B2C, physical versus digital products, whether the customer is a company that registers to pay VAT, and many other things in the default logic. And then if you don't like the default logic, if we're not covering something, you can define your own resolvers and plug into the system just like you would before. But for 99% of the use cases, in, use cases inside the EU, we actually know how to do the right thing. And we even support, as I said, various edge cases such as US companies collecting VAT and so on. As long as you tell the system what you want, the system can make the right decision. We have this in production on SaaS e-commerce solutions for over a year now. It's much more solid. And I simply realized that we cannot expect people to pay for tax clouds and many customers actually get this wrong. Many customers 
frequently have no clue what's legal in their own country. So this way the system is more smart and guides them to the right solution. And I really think that there is no e-commerce solution anywhere that has this kind of tax intelligence, which is why uh, many systems are now actually adopting our tax library. We also realized that merchants really like defining discounts, and we shipped with no discount UI the first time around. We created a contrib module, and in time we realized that it's actually core functionality. So this time around, we will have a discount UI. Keep in mind it won't be in the first alpha. We need to focus on making the underlying API flexible first. What I want to do is you see the conditions. When you're defining a discount, you can say this applies to this product type or this product category or this category of customers. Well, I want to actually embed rules here via the new API they're planning. I need to talk to them to see uh, what our timelines are for that and how we're going to approach that. This means that if rules doesn't have it in time, we might need to implement something else or delay the discount UI. We'll see. And payments are the last thing. And the thing that we talked a lot about, and I mean weeks, but there's no code yet. Why? Because I feel that you can actually start a project without payments. You can use BART's payment module, or you can write a custom integration, integrate Stripe or whatever in a one-off way, and, and simply finish your project that way. Uh, what we actually want to do, starting from January 1st, is to have a really expanded API that will cover things that payment modules needed to do manually before, things such as authorizations. So if the payment was only pre-authorized, we need to offer you a UI to actually capture the payments. Same for refunds. You need to be able to issue a refund uh, that's partial or complete. Uh, also... Um, menu routes for accepting pingbacks, uh, built-in tokenization, which means commerce card on filing core. Simply the recurring API needs to be a part of the main payment API, uh, which also means one less module to port. Uh, we want to have a concept of modes, whether you're alive or in a sandbox. So all of these things simply make the payment module smaller, which will make them easier to port, which means they will be available, available more quickly. At the same time, we're looking at the concept of double entry bookkeeping. And this is really important for many use cases. Basically, it means that we need to be able to say, to ask, what do I owe the customer and what does the customer owe me? At the order level or at a global level? A customer might pay you for three shirts, but you realize that one of them is no longer in stock. Someone made a mistake. So now you owe the customer something. The system needs to be able to tell you that. Or you might be se sending stuff to the customer, but only invoicing at the end of the month. So you need to be able to say, okay, what does the customer need to pay me for the previous period? And then, so you can invoice that. Uh, so by actually being more strict about the transactions that we record, the flow of money between the customer and the, the stores, we should be able to have a lot more intelligence and offer a lot more flexibility in how we actually accept payments and what we're able to do with the system. And as I said, this is all um, experimental still, but we've had many, many exciting discussions about it. We have Commerce to the Tax Office hours every Wednesday at 3 p.m. GMT plus 2, which is this time zone, basically. Uh, I mean, I'm at IRC all the time, but th this is the time when everyone gathers, all of the contributors. So if you want to discuss commerce with the tax, if you have questions, if you want an issue to work on, this is the right time to show up. We've had many contributions. We try to highlight our contributors in the contributor spotlight. We are publishing on the Drupal Commerce blog. And I'm doing the Commerce to the Tech Stories blog series. Every week I publish one blog post about Commerce to the Tech improvements. We skipped this one because of Thanksgiving officially, but unofficially because of this camp. Uh, but we'll continue next week. Uh, so that's the best way to actually see how all of this is coming along and what the new changes are. And I'm going to ask the first question, if I may. When is this going to be ready? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're, we are planning to do the first alpha by the end of the year, which is in a month. That gives us time to stabilize the profile module and inline entity form. 
The alpha won't be production ready, which means we won't actually guarantee updates and we won't have discounts or uh, payments. But it's enough to actually create a branch of your fancy new site, start playing with it and start figuring out which parts are missing. If your project is starting in Q1 2016 and you're launching in Q2 or Q3, then Commerce Hulotex is a perfect fit. Uh, our plan, of course, is to, to deliver a beta soon after, and we will be pursuing that aggressively. Of course, we need help for that. So if you have any favorite features, or you know you need things such as shipping or licensing, uh, it's time to start planning that and including that into your project estimates. And now it's your turn. Yeah. Well, we log some information. Legally, I'm not sure that's enough. We have uh, uh, a contributor looking into that. So I I'm still waiting to hear from, here whether we, from him whether we need to make changes or whether the changes are too big and need to live in a country. It's going to be a subject of a future blog post. Uh, so if you want to know about that today, ping David Kitchen. He used to work for Commerce Guys, uh, <clears throat> and he's uh, available on Drupal.org and IRC. So he's the one researching that, uh, and I will know soon. And second question, also according to this uh, purpose, uh, there is in the European Union started the, the MOS, the mini one-stop system, and it can also be used it's, uh, for preparing your, to make your tax uh, statement. And it will also serve some kind of XML file inputs. So we'll yeah, we have no plans to generate tax returns. That's too big of a deal for us, and it would require a lot of work. So that's something where you're still on your own. That, that's something people pay money for external services for, and it makes sense. Unless someone wants to actually work on that full time. No, that's it. So our improvements are that we know the tax rates up front, and we know, yeah, and we know when they change. We are maintaining those changes, and we have the actual logic there. And the logic also overlaps a lot with whether you're registered to collect VAT as a company, where the customer is coming from, EU, non-EU. So we now have all of that units tested and used in production. So it, it's a step forward. Go. Well, I've talked a lot with Pavel, the creator of Cilius, and basically Pavel wants to integrate our libraries into Cilius. So the plan was to integr integrate addressing zone and taxes so that they can get our tax improvements and our address improvements. There's an open issue in the Cilius issue queue for that, but no contributors yet. Cilius has no full-time contributors, which means it's all done on, on their free time. So if someone wants to take that on, it would be accepted into Cilius. It hasn't happened yet because no one had time to work on it. I'm too busy on commerce to the tax, and Pavel is busy on other things. So Cilius wants to start using our libraries. On the other hand, I've also met the creator of Payum, uh, and he was really interested in cooperation, but I realized in the end that it, 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 it's, it's the same answer as why we are not using the payment module, which is you have these done solutions, but we have uh, a lot of new ideas that we want to pursue. And it, if we want to try and do that, that requires rewriting half of that code. So there's actually no gain to be had in integrating the existing solution if we are planning to change it that much. So th that's why we ended up not actually integrating payment or pay um, or any other solution. I also looked at OmniPay, for example. 
Go on, Morten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I have I have no help and I would love help. <laughs> Basically, I'm the only person paid to to work on commerce to the tax and then we have contributors who come and go. Uh, we are now getting some UX help, uh, front end help not yet. I would love any help that I can get simply to get that as good as possible this time around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's talk after we've had our alpha. Awesome. Go. Well, we have migrating core now, which means it's really easy for anyone to write migrations. Yeah, yeah. So I personally won't be working on any migration because it's simply easy work for a contributor, but I have no doubt that someone will whoever gets a project that includes a migration phase first, just like we now have Commerce Migrate that migrates from Ubercart on D6 to Commerce on D7. We needed that for a few projects, someone wrote it, and then other people contributed. So that's the same thing that will happen here. And uh, it's easier than ever now that Migrate is in core. So if anyone wants to start tackling that, I would be happy to answer any questions. And I think that the part that actually migrates from Ubercart can be ported directly from the Commerce Migrate module because that side hasn't changed. Go. No, so for shipping we have this really, really broad blog post that includes packaging and multiple destinations and rating and many kinds of things that I don't think we'll have the resources to build. So we, we need to figure out how we're going to fund that because either we will just port the 1.x shipping uh, because it's easy and use that and then continue to improve on that or we will get a few big clients and then do the whole thing. But Commerce Guys itself won't have the resources to pursue that. Uh, on the licensing side, there's still a question of architecture. There are people interested in porting it. So I know that we will at least port commerce license. Uh, I mean, I will be working with contributors to do that. And for license building, we need to think about how we can make it more user friendly. So that's definitely a discussion I hope to have with you. Yeah, I used that example in my talk. <laughs> you weren't paying attention. Shame. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well, I'm here the entire weekend, so if you think of anything else. Thank you.